This is Dimitri Lascaris for The Real News, reporting from Montreal, Quebec. The small town of Lac Mégantic in Quebec's historic eastern townships will forever be associated with one of the deadliest accidents in Canadian history. On the morning of July 6, 2013, a crude oil train explosion killed 47 people. The train was carrying volatile crude oil from the back and shale oil fields of North Dakota. It derailed and exploded, killing residents and destroying the town's downtown area. The mass funeral in the town of just over 5,000 persons was broadcast live across Canada. It became a national day of mourning. Over four years later, on Friday of last week, a Canadian jury found three former rail workers not guilty of criminal negligence causing the deaths of Lac Megantic residents. The question must now be asked, why were the workers charged for this tragedy? And moreover, why was no executive of the Montreal, Maine and Atlantic Railway Company prosecuted? With us to discuss this, I am pleased to be joined by veteran train engineer and wreck investigator Fritz Edler, chairperson of the Defense Committee for Tom Harding and Richard Labrie, two of the workers who were charged and found not guilty. Fritz joins us today from Washington, D.C. Fritz, thank you very much for joining us on The Real News. Pleasure. Uh, I'm glad to be with you. So, Fritz, let's start by talking about the basic allegations against the acquitted railway workers. What was the essential basis of the Crown's uh, allegations of criminal negligence, and in your view, why did the prosecution fail? Well, it, it seemed plain to us from the beginning that this was putting the uh, things in the wrong order. In other words, for the people in the town and for people in Canada and across North America who wanted to know why this wreck took place and what we could do to prevent it, it was completely wrong to start out from just moments after the days after the wreck with a exclusive focus on Tom Harding and then later his coworker, Richard Labrie, and decide that the way to find out about this wreck would be to do a criminal prosecution instead of what the people in the community wanted, which was a commission of inquiry. That real public inquiry has never taken place. Uh, this is the absolute worst way to find out why a wreck took place and who's really responsible uh, but instead, what the government did was they took their lead from the industry. They took their lead from Ed Burkhart, the, uh, the chair of the Montreal, Maine and Atlantic Railroad, who in Megantic began to accuse Tom Harding of responsibility exclusively. And the government took that up and made that their focus and never really seriously pursued the broader issues uh, for prosecution. But essentially, in your view, what was it that happened at the trial? And I appreciate you, you, you may not be a legal expert, but as somebody who is a veteran uh, wreck investigator, why do you think this case fell apart in the end? Well, I have come to Lac Macantic and to Quebec eight, uh, almost, I guess, eight times now in the course of this uh, campaign, uh, this, this trial. And uh, I've had a chance to see, you know, on the ground firsthand, not only as a railroader, but also as, as somebody who uh, is a supporter of uh, Tom Harding and Richard Labrie, exactly how things were on the, on the ground. And one of the things you found out is that if you walk the streets of Lac Megantic and you ask people, they would tell you most often that, you know, they got the wrong people, the wrong people are on trial. There was a good understanding from early on, and this was very frustrating to the people who live there because it, it really made it that much more unlikely that they were really going to get accountability and justice for their losses and really get to the core of the problems. And one of the problems was that the railroad still operates through the town of Lac Megantic and still presents the same kinds of, of problems because those problems stem from risky and dangerous management decisions. And so let's talk about those problems. What in your view are the principal problems that led to these, uh, this particular disaster and, and may you know, create dangers in the future? Well, the, uh, you know, frankly, what it was, was the, the Montreal, Maine and Atlantic, and they're not alone in this, in the industry, were in such a big hurry to make the big money that they could make from the transport of this highly volatile oil that they just threw all other cautions aside. 
as a railroader, one of the very first things that, that hit me when I drove from Nantes into Lac Magantic was to see the derail protected siding that exists in Nantes and is built there for the purpose of securing equipment to prevent it from rolling down a grade, for example. That's what it was built for and the MMA wouldn't use it. They made sure they couldn't use it by making the train too long. They just had to get that couple of extra cars and a couple of extra gallons or tons. And those factors, uh, there's plenty of others. They everything, everything from operating that most dangerous kind of a train with only one crew member, which meant that the train could only go forward. It couldn't go back, it couldn't split, it couldn't do any of those things that might be critically important in any kind in any number of situations. So by policy, and in the weeks and months before July 6th of 2013, the, the community was put at risk, the workers were put at risk, and it was done for money. And just as for the, for the benefit of our members of our audience who aren't aware of the specifics of this tragedy, uh, the, the train rolled down a grade and that resulted ultimately in the explosion that killed 47 people, right? That's correct. And uh, uh, the, what happened was is that they made the train risky by policy and by practice, and then they purposefully didn't use all of the resources that were available to protect uh, mm -hmm. that came out in the trial. See, one of the things that came out in the trial after 34 government witnesses was is that the inadequate and known inadequate cars for transporting these these oils uh, were even yet more overloaded, overloaded beyond because they could get a little more in there and get more money. So they put it even more at risk. And all of these factors, uh, that including the prohibition from the crews being able to use the automatic braking system to secure the equipment as a, as a supplemental way of securing the equipment, that it that rolled through the rail industry in North America when railroaders like myself, locomotive engineers, found out that that was their policy. Because that's the very first thing. That's like railroading 101. That's what we do. We put automatic brake on the train. That's how we, one of the ways that we secure it, that system was available to them and they threatened Tom Harding and other crew members with discipline if they did it. Are these railway workers out of the woods yet, or do they remain exposed to criminal prosecution from another authority? Yeah, and this is this actually is the big thing because it, all across the world, people who know the name Lac Magantique heard that the that the rail workers were acquitted on the 19th of January of all the charges against them, and there was a big cheer, you know, in many different sectors, including in the in the community of Lac Magantique. They thought that this was progress. And then uh, in short order, within days of that, we received word that on February 5th, Tom Harding and Richard Libby are called back to the courthouse to face federal charges, federal charges under the Railway Safety Act, federal charges under the Fisheries Act. And these charges still carry with them the possibility of jail time and ruinous fines for these individuals who've already suffered so much. And, and uh, this really raises a question about the, the, the nature of regulation of the railway industry in Canada. Who's responsible for regulating the transportation of oil by rail in Canada? And do you think that this organization is under the undue influence of the industry and that that's played a role in the decision, the apparent decision not to prosecute any of the executives for these dangerous policies that you've outlined? Well, fortunately, we know more about this because of some of the testimony that came out in the course of the uh, prosecution witnesses in the, in the trial. So a lot of that material, which normally might, you know, never reach the public, uh, actually was part of the trial uh, testimony. Uh, there's also material related to this in the two investigative reports, one that was done by the Surete of Quebec, for uh, uh, early on for uh, the Surete, and then also by the Transportation Safety Board of Canada. And Transportation Safety Board of Canada in particular identified 18, originally 19 factors that were the, the factors that were responsible for the wreck and the, and the devastation. 
And what's pretty obvious is that Mr. Harding and Mr. Labrie have nothing to do with this, most all of them. But, uh, and, and it identifies Transport Canada, for example. Transport Canada is identified uh, as the regulating agency that's supposed to oversee a lot of these things and their failures, their enabling of these dangerous practices. So a lot of this stuff is out there, but unfortunately, because there's never really been a proper commission of inquiry uh, it, and there is no plan evident for a real prosecution of those things, I don't know that we were gonna uh, ever see uh, the real culprits of these uh, decisions brought to justice. So Fritz, we've seen other bomb train explosions uh, as they've been dubbed. Uh, there was one in uh, Illinois near the Wisconsin border. Uh, one in Ontario, where seven tanker cars uh, caught fire. Another in Mount Carbon, West Virginia, a 19 car oil explosion darkened the sky above the town. And have there been, in, in, in the light of these various, uh, these various dangerous and destructive incidents of uh, oil by rail, have there been safety measures put in place, uh, whether south of the border or in Canada, uh, that are meaningfully addressing the dangers that cause these incidents? Well, first, I'd like to step back and say that some of the disasters that are happening on the railroads that aren't explosions are still as a part of this, the same problems that we're describing here about the risky decisions that are made solely for the purpose of, uh, you know, saving money or some other uh, priority other than the safety of the communities. But, and I could mention the example of the wreck of Amtrak 501 outside of Seattle or the Amtrak train 188 outside of Philadelphia. In each of those cases, we could talk about a lot of these things. But in terms of the measures about the so-called bomb trains, uh, what we can say is that uh, the industry and the regulators have both been slow to respond. Uh, the uh, type of container that, the, that these were shipped in, the uh, the type of tank cars, which were known to be inadequate for most of the dangers that are posed by uh, that kind of transportation. Those got some upgrades, but it turns out that the upgrades were insufficient and there isn't enough of the fleet. And as the market fluctuates and the pressure is on to put more of this stuff on the railroads, there's no guarantee that from a structural point of view, you won't have the kind of situation that was testified to in the Harding and Labrie trial where the railroad put even more volatile oil beyond the capacity of the safety uh, limits of these cars uh, just because they could, you know, every ton of extra was more money. Right. Well, this has been Dimitri Lascaris speaking to uh, veteran wreck investigator Fritz Edler, chairperson of the Defense Committee for Tom Harding and Richard Labrie about the acquittal of three railway workers in uh, connection with the uh, oil, rain, uh, oil by rail disaster in Lac Megante, Quebec. Thank you very much for joining us today, Fritz. Thank you, sir. And this is Dimitri Lascaris reporting for The Real News.